I'll go ahead and get us started then. Good evening, everyone. My name is Nicole Watson, and I am the director of the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery. Um, on behalf of the gallery, the Women's Art Institute, and St. Catherine University, welcome to tonight's artist talk. Um, this event is part of the virtual exhibition, uh, Pandemic Art Lessons, which has been curated by Patricia Olson and Paige Ty. Um, and, and those folks, Paige and uh, Patricia, will be moderating tonight. So before I turn it over to them, though, um, I'd like to begin tonight's event by recognizing that St. Catherine University um, is located on the land of the Dakota people, specifically the Sisseton and Wapaton bands. My home is near Ohewahi, also known as Pilot Knob, a sacred burial and gathering space of the Dakota people, in which they continue to use for their ceremonies today. Ohawahi overlooks Bedote, the place where the Dakota people began. It also overlooks Fort Snelling, where hundreds of Dakota people were confined and perished. The Dakota people continue to live and love on these lands. Though I know we are all joining tonight's conversation from different locations, I ask that we take a moment to consider and honor the land we each inhabit. Thank you. So I have the great pleasure of introducing um, tonight's, one of tonight's moderators. Patricia Olson is a professor emerita in the Department of Art and Art History at St. Kate's, where she led the graphic design program for 21 years. She has also had a simultaneous and successful career as a fine artist, exploring printmaking, book arts, video, installation, and painting. She currently teaches and directs the Women's Art Institute, and she is a member of Form and Content Gallery in Minneapolis, where she presented her most recent solo exhibition titled Fractured Fairy Tales and Macerated Myths. So please join me in welcoming Pat Olson. Thank you, Nicole. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Yeah, and um, I join Nicole in welcoming you to our virtual artist talk for this online exhibition, Pandemic Art Lessons. Um, this invitational exhibition was conceived and curated by Paige Tai and myself in response to these past months of the coronavirus pandemic, subsequent isolation and social upheaval. We knew that artists have turned on their creativity and delved deeply into their studio practice. We are pleased to feature 16 women and non-binary artists from across the United States in this virtual exhibition. Tonight, we welcome three of these artists to more fully explore their work, and we'll hear from Carolyn Halliday, Fazia Khan, and Natalie Vestine. Uh, Paige Tai, my co-curator, will tell you more about each of them in a minute. Um, so I'd like to do some thanking and acknowledgements. Uh, Nicole Watson, director of the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery, whom you've just met. Uh, the gallery is the co-sponsor and web host of this exhibition and virtual talk. Thanks to her. Thanks to Lise Ackerman Frank, who is the tech assistant for the gallery in the Department of Art and Art History. And she has beautifully designed and put together the web pages of this exhibition. None of this would have happened at all without those two people. Many thanks to my co-conspirator, Paige Tai. And lastly, I'd like to thank and acknowledge our colleagues in the Department of Art and Art History at St. Catherine University. Long may you wave. But of course, first a bit about the Women's Art Institute. Um, part of our service at the Women's Art Institute is to contemporary women and non-binary artists. It includes presenting public lectures, study groups, opportunities, and exhibitions like this one uh, throughout the year. And Pandemic Art Lessons uh, is our first online exhibition. Um, however, the core of our program is a college-level June course called the Summer Studio Intensive. So women and non-binary artists, what are your questions about art, your art practice, the art world, and beyond? Each year, the summer studio intensive course of the Women's Art Institute grows out of the questions that contemporary women artists of all ages and backgrounds bring to the Institute to ponder, to contemplate, to share, to discuss, sometimes to argue about, and oftentimes to make art out of. This rigorous four-week course 
It's a studio course. Uh, it's specifically designed for individuals who have mastered basic skills in visual art and are now ready to pursue deeper levels of understanding and expression in their work. Over the 20 years that we've been offering this course, and let me just do an aside and say that 20 years is a very long time for a program like this. So we must be fulfilling a very large need in our community. Over the 20 years we've been offering this course, we've welcomed painters, printmakers, sculptors, fiber artists, photographers, collages, video installation, performance art, and everything, uh, every combination you can imagine. Students have ranged from 19 to 78 and come from all over. And we've even had students from Iraq and from Mexico. Participants in the Institute work closely with the teachers and each student presents a major portfolio of work at the conclusion of the course, exhibited later in the summer at the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery. We also hear from a host of regional artists, art historians and curators, engendering context and a sense of possibility of community. Brochures for the upcoming summer studio intensive scheduled for June 7th through July 1st, 2021 will be available next month in January. And you can also get more information on the website through the St. Kate's website. Um, and you can email us, you have our, everybody here has our email uh, address if you wanna know more and please tell your friends. So now we'd like to get to our main event. Uh, we're gonna hear from our three featured artists after which we're going to briefly acknowledge the other artists in the exhibition who have joined us tonight. And then there will be time for a few questions. Uh, so it is my distinct pleasure to introduce my co-curator, Paige Tai. Paige has a BA in studio art and art history from the University of Minnesota Morris and an MFA in public practice art from Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. Uh, an art educator, Paige teaches through St. Paul Community Education and her own studio. And I look forward to her co-teaching the Women's Art Institute with me in June, 2021. Take it away, Paige. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Nicole and Pat. I'm very excited to be here and I'm just gonna jump right in and introduce our first uh, artist of the evening, which is uh, Fazia Khan, uh, who is a multimedia artist and former OBGYN working in Hopkins, Minnesota. Uh, she is a um, Women's Art Institute alum from 2019 and received an artist initiative grant this year in 2020. Uh, she also has two upcoming shows, one at the Phipps, uh, opening February 28th, and one at the Hopkins Center for the Arts, uh, which will be opening in mid-May. Uh, my favorite line from Ms. Khan's artist statement um, for Pandemic Artist Lessons was, practice makes one faster, more inventive and playful. Posting work invites conversation. I'm excited to learn more about Fazia's work this evening, and I will invite you to be our first speaker. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, Pat, Nicole, Lise. Thank you to the Women's Art Institute and St. Kate's. Um, that was a, a wonderful experience in 2019, and I really credit the Women's Art Institute for uh, encouraging me to fill out that application and send it in <laughs> for the grant. So. Um, and I'm very uh, happy and honored to be invited to speak tonight. Um, so the pandemic was a tough, tough time for me. Um, I, my grant period started uh, March 1st and I uh, had to purchase some materials. I had to uh, get a new computer, get some new software. And I spent the first two months kind of learning that and after that, um, you know, it was May and we were in shutdown. I didn't I needed to interview women for my project. And I thought, how am I going to do that? Um, and then George Floyd happened and I essentially became paralyzed. I didn't feel like I could do anything. I was just sitting at home. I was reading books and watching Netflix and not really doing a whole lot of anything. 
um, and really got pretty disheartened with with where I was where I was going. I saw that a lot of people on social media were posting challenges and doing lots of art in response. And I thought, boy, how can they how can they think? How can they create? Where is my imagination? And so I decided finally that I needed to do something and set my own challenge. So if you can go to the first slide, please. Um, so in July, I decided, OK, I have an iPad and I'm going to draw a mandala a day. It's not something I'm going to I'm just doing this as an exercise, a meditation, a sketch a day, something to motivate me, not necessarily to have an end product. So I have an app called Procreate on my iPad. And one of the nice things that it has is, an, is a symmetry grid with assisted drawing. So I can create either a radial or quadrant uh, symmetrical um, grid where if I draw a line in one corner, it'll repeat it eight times or four times. And so that makes drawing a mandala in this kind of format much easier. And I can see what it's going to look like much easier and decide whether I like something and discard it or not. The other um, advantage of this is that I have unlimited colors on my iPad and unlimited brushes. So I could really experiment every day with doing something different uh, just to kind of see what was available. Um, so this is the first one, day one, July 1. And you can see that it's pretty simple. Uh, I didn't get too elaborate. And then if you can go to the next one. And this is day 10. Um, now, the other thing that kept me going through the pandemic and through all of this upheaval and the quarantines is running in the woods. Uh, it got me outside, got me in nature. I could do it without a mask. And uh, so on my run on this particular day, I was in French Park and I kept stepping on a bunch of acorns and I saw the acorns and I thought, oh, I should use this in my mandala today because the acorn is so interesting to look at the way the little overlapping, uh, I don't know what you call them, areas are on the nut. So I came home and I, I drew this uh, and I used some different blending tools and some different brushes than I had up to that point. Um, can you go to the next one? So the next day, my husband bought me these socks. I don't know if anybody can see. <laughs> um, they're charcoal gray and white, and they have these three uh, green circles on the back. And I put them in the wash with this tablecloth that I bought from Pakistan that was dyed to my specifications. And they came out pink. <laughs> So I thought, well, I'm going to use these as my inspiration today. Every day it was something different. Um, I usually sat in the living room and looking out the front window. And so this day I took the colors that were in the socks, which was the charcoal gray, the pink, the green, and the white. And it was pouring rain. And so instead of doing a really um, you know, rigid, constructed, center, I decided to go a little bit more free form with what looked like raindrops to me. So that was my inspiration for that one. Um, can you go to the next slide? So this is a hand painted chest that I bought when I was in Pakistan on my last trip. I had actually gone into a gift shop to look for gifts for people to bring home. And I fell in love with this. And I went to all kinds of trouble to get this shipped back. It, I think it cost more to ship it than it did to buy it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a beautiful chest. It opens up. And uh, so this was the inspiration for the next mandala, which is one of the ones that's in the show. And if you can go to the next slide. And so you can kind of see I took the colors and I took a lot of the shapes that were in there and created this. And I, I really like this one. It, it makes me think of tabletops I've seen in Italy where they do the marble inlay. Um, so that was the 16th. So we're moving along. Next slide. Um, so on this day, I was scrolling through Instagram 
and I came across an account from a woman named Casey Zavalia, who is really amazing. She does the most amazing hand embroidered portraits of people. Um, my grant project, I'm machine embroidering portraits. So I, I saw her work and I just, I just don't know how she does it. And one day I'm going to go visit her studio and, and see her. But she posted an image of the green mask by an English painter, Oswald Burley, which is uh, a woman who is dressed in carnival attire, holding a mask. Um, and these are the colors that are the primary colors in the painting that I used. And if you look closely at the center, um, the very central motif, the bright green, those are actually the little masks that were in the painting. So, and I think this has kind of that carnival feeling look to it, it does to me. And next slide. Um, so on day 25, I wanted to do something different from the octagonal um, or the round mandala shapes. And so on this day, I asked my husband for inspiration, which is uh, hit and miss. Um, he's sitting over there listening to me. Uh, anyway, he said, why don't you make something around the tree of life? And so this is my very stylized, repeated tree of life. And I think I used colors here that I had used in one of the other ones. So I made a drawing a day for 31 days. And one day I actually did three drawings. And it was a really good experience. And I actually ended up with lots of things that I wouldn't consider sketches now, but are actually nice to look at that, that could be reproduced. And I'm going to show these in their entirety printed out at the show that's going to be at the FIPS. Um, so last slide. So this is a poem that I wrote. My church meets on Zoom. And one Sunday, the minister talked about poetry and about three specific forms of poetry. The dikaz, which is um, 10 syllables in three lines divided into two, three, and then five syllables the haiku, which is three lines of five, seven, five syllables. And the American sentence is one line of 17 syllables. And he challenged us to write a poem using each technique about the pandemic and how it has affected us. And I combined all three into one poem. And, and uh, this is, oh, my time is up. Um, this is uh, after a run, I was lying on the grass and looking up at the blue sky, it was a gorgeous, gorgeous day, beautiful temperature. And for just a moment, life felt normal. Um, it says, I lie on the grass after a long run. The blades prick my skin, the sun's warmth and fresh breezes caress my body. Watching clouds drift against a blue sky, for a moment, life is normal. So what I learned, we need purpose. When paralyzed, set limits on art making, but make something. Practice makes one faster, more inventive and playful. Posting work invites conversation. And I realize that sometimes a body of work emerges from the practice instead of having the idea first in order to generate the work. And by the end of the month, I'd had many conversations with people over Instagram, and I felt pretty connected again to society. So thank you very much. Great, thank you yeah. so much. Um, so uh, our next speaker is Natalie Vestine. Natalie is a writer and artist who combines text, ink drawings, and folk painting into their work. Uh, they're also um, going to be discussing specifically uh, some work around data from her job as an infectious disease researcher and using the folk uh, icon or subject matter of the dollar horse, which is a symbol of safety. 
Uh, she processed her knowledge of varying topics, including lung ultrasounds, and I'm going to say this incorrectly, but alveoli. <laughs> um, what strikes me most about uh, this idea of art as a process of understanding is Natalie's understanding of the need to collectively mark the pandemic. Um, I'd also really like to thank Natalie um, for introducing Pat and I to um, the other artists in the Pandemic Artist Lab, which is something that Natalie was a part of. So thank you, Natalie, for also your curatorial help in this show. And I'd like to introduce you as the second uh, artist speaker. Hey, everybody. Um, thank you so much to Nicole, Pat, and Paige um, for the enormous work in curating this exhibition um, and all of the care that you took with everybody's arts and statements and everything. Um, so yeah, tonight I'm going to talk about a project that I kind of fell into during the pandemic and that is ongoing. And um, it's a project that I'm calling uh, Data Horses. And um, it's something that I started in March. As Paige mentioned, uh, I'm an infectious diseases epidemiologist. And so during January and February of this year, I was seeing a lot of data come out of Wuhan and then later um, seeing the data coming out of Italy and then New York and seeing things kind of um, become what they are now. And uh, so this project is a way of dealing with that data and with a lot of that uncertainty that came with the data. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so what I did was I painted dollar horses and I painted them whenever I had some concern about data or something heavy um, that kind of came with looking at data or looking at images from the pandemic early on. And the dollar horse is a Swedish symbol. It's a folk symbol, uh, usually a symbol of protection and safety in a home. And so my first dollar horse was this guy because I needed a baseline to my data. And so that's a pretty traditional dollar horse. Um, but going forward, I really wanted to use these very traditional brush strokes to sort of build a vocabulary for the data that I was seeing. Um, and I think I wanted to sort of merge what I was feeling about how daily life and my work life were starting to intersect because that's something that I've always had trouble carrying this, um, this being a data scientist when so much of that can appear dehumanizing, um, being an artist, being a writer, being a daughter and sister, all of these different things that don't necessarily always match up. So next slide, please. And this was my first horse. This is called Distant Desire Lines. And this horse um, was a way of expressing uh, something I was seeing when people were social distancing very early on during the pandemic when they were taking walks. And, you know, as this was, I painted this horse in March and people didn't really even have a very clear idea of what was going on. We were just kind of, um, you know, sort of adapting our lives to the information that we had at the time. And I was really struck by the fact that when I would take a walk, people would veer away from each other onto the boulevard. And this was still uh, winter in Minnesota. So uh, everything was kind of dead and smushed. And you could kind of tell that in the boulevard, there would be these desire lines that would be formed when the grass and the flowers grew up. And it was just something that I found very striking because it was this physical manifestation of love in a, a way that we don't normally see love being expressed. And that was through distance. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Uh, this next horse um, is called the beam of a flashlight. And this was um, probably one of the most important horses that I painted. Uh, I was looking at a lot of images um, of x-rays and ultrasounds. And one of the things that really struck me at this time was that, um, you know, there's always a lot of uncertainty when it comes to diagnosing pneumonia or, um, you know, knowing how to treat pneumonia. And there are a number of things that can happen. 
But one of the things that was really getting to me at this time was that clinicians were seeing the same image over and over and over. And there's something about that repetition of seeing, you know, um, the same thing on an ultrasound, the same thing on an x-ray that kind of starts to fumble at a language and you start seeing the repetition of those images um, create a, a call of alarm essentially. And so this horse was intended to represent something that is very beautiful and very awful. And that is bee lines on an ultrasound. Mm -hmm. And bee lines are an image that shows up when the ultrasound hits something that echoes a little bit more. So uh, the lungs shouldn't necessarily be echoing a lot or they shouldn't be creating lightness on an ultrasound. Um, and so when they are echoing, a lot, you start to see these lines because there's fluid in the lungs. And this was an image that uh, I kept coming across very early on during the pandemic, but over and over and over. Next slide, please. Uh, and then a little bird corrects the error was um, inspired by the St. John's Bible, which is a handwritten and illuminated Bible. And um, as you might expect, there are quite a few mistakes in it, as will happen when you are handwriting a Bible. And so when somebody would make a mistake, they would put a correction in a footnote and then paint a little bird where uh, the correction ought to go. And the implication was that the little bird flies the correction up to the place where it should be. And I found that really charming. <laughs> and um, I, it was just something that I was thinking about a lot, especially with a lot of research being published that later turned out to be inaccurate. People just striving and striving to find something that worked. Um, my own life as a scientist being a life of a trajectory of error with this faith that at some point in the distant future, um, I'll have done something helpful or um, all of this will make sense in some way. Next slide, please. Um, and then these are some horses that weren't in the show, um, but this one is about gradients and it's kind of about how um, I think we're all in that place where we are observing things a lot more. So I was thinking about um, all of this really uh, beautiful math that occurs in the lungs, where when we take a breath, um, there is this exchange of pressure and volume and gas concentration. And in order for that to happen, there's a balance in the lungs that has to be lost in order for it to return. So I was really thinking about uh, return and how in order to go home or go back to safety or go back to balance, we have to leave it first. Um, and this horse really, this horse represents my homesickness. It's my impression of my parents' fields and woods that I really want to see sometime very soon. And then also the observation of this alignment of Mars, Jupiter and Saturn above the moon this summer. Next slide. Um, this horse is kind of about, um, I was thinking a lot about the intersection of public and individual tragedies and how they kind of all intersect, how we're experiencing this collective grief, but how we all also have our individual and community sadnesses as well. And I based it off of a textile that I um, have from my great aunt and my great aunt was someone who really inspired a lot of my love of rose modeling and my desire to be close to this culture and do something to kind of be closer to my ancestors once they started passing away. And um, for my great aunts and for me, um, 1918, the year that many people think of as the flu pandemic um, was the year of the great fire. And so in our, um, in our civics classes all throughout school, it was all the great fire and learning that to be of this particular place, you were part of the heritage of this great fire and this tragedy. And, um, it, you know, it was just a way of thinking that um, we're all sort of building an idea of home and identity 
and culture inside us, even as we think everything's going wrong. And I kind of came back to that idea of the gradient too, of, you know, always, always wanting to return and always wanting to go home in some way as people, but also having to leave or having to go through some particular trial uh, before we can return or in order to return. Next slide. And then the alveoli in me, see the alveoli in you. Um, this was a way of thinking about face coverings and also of thinking about my mom who a couple of years ago was in the ICU on a ventilator for about a month and a half. And it was something that kind of changed my entire life and my entire way of working in infectious diseases. And there was a lot of debate about face coverings. Um, there was a lot of debate in the media, but then there was also a lot of debate in the scientific community about you know, how effective are they? What is the evidence? Um, you know, just really looking at, at what, we're, what we're actually asking people to do. And um, so that was something that was always on my mind. But then I was also thinking a lot during this time about how when I was wearing a face covering, it kind of encouraged me to have a gentler mindset um, which is something I'm always striving toward. And uh, it, it just made me think that when I'm wearing a face covering and I see somebody else wearing a face covering, um, I think about the alveoli and I think about everything I learned about the alveoli, um, which are the little air pockets in the lungs, by the way, um, when my mom was ill and just thinking about the little things that we do to show each other that we're, incredibly precious um, at this very small level. Um, so that was kind of just something I wanted to keep in mind. And I don't, I think that might be the last slide. Is that the last slide? Yes. Okay, I think, yeah. So um, just to kind of uh, end, uh, this project was really fascinating for me to do. It wasn't in my usual style. And I think a lot of it came out of the fact that we're all, or maybe I shouldn't generalize, but I think a number of people are having a lot of trouble with concentration and focus. And um, I kind of interpret this as us having, um, having to kind of not think about a lot of different things that are too hard to think about right now. And so um, what we're left with is this sort of dance across the, the things that are available for us to think about. And I wanted this project to kind of respect that choreography and to be small and somewhat limited by form, but also to have uh, or to create a space where I could kind of think through some of these things that were in some ways unfathomable in other ways. Um, so yeah, those are those are my horses. Yeah. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, I this is the second time I've heard you speak about this, so it's really great to um, revisit this work. Uh, and now for our third uh, artist, Carolyn Holliday. Um, on a personal note, I was lucky enough to be in the Women's Art Institute with Carolyn in 2007 and, um, and see some of her first large-scale knitted sculptures. So that's my little sentimental part of my intro. Um, Carolyn has an extensive exhibition record, including uh, the gold standard of textile and fiber art in New York City uh, exhibition in 2019, and also in Madrid, Spain in 2018, the eighth biennial of contemporary textile art. Um, what I enjoyed most about the pieces that uh, Ms. Holiday chose for this exhibition is the contrast it highlights how as artists we are processing a pandemic and a social uprising and Carolyn's choice of work and what she chose to work on um, speaks to that contrast. So uh, a warm welcome to our third, our third speaker of the evening. Thanks so much to Pat and Paige for inviting me to be a part of this exhibition and uh, to be on this artist panel. Um, I, I really, truly am honored. And I 
I thank everybody who took the time out uh, to Zoom in tonight. And a thank you to the Women's Art Institute, which has given so much to so many artists and certainly myself. And it is really fun that Paige and I did the Women's Art Institute together way back when. So when describing my work, I say that I use the vocabulary of textiles to create sculptural items that reflect my experiences in nature. I choose textiles because of the implicit references to domesticity and binary gender that informed my sexist upbringing. I'm a materialist, process-driven artist. I respond to materials that are tactile, malleable enough to knit, or visually intriguing to me. Conceptually, my work is informed by the conversations I have with two evolutionary biologists and ecologists, Dr. Thayer Halliday Schultz, shout out, and Dr. Elizabeth Beyer, another shout out. And I rely on them for scientific information and making sure that what I say about evolution or ecology is correct. My art practice also includes daily walks in the urban environment where I live. And I document that on um, Instagram. A few years ago, I decided when I was in kind of a frozen period of not making art that the one thing I could do was take some pictures on my walk, which influenced the art choices I make. Um, and the photos that, that I take represent my aesthetic and um, either consciously or subconsciously affect my work, I believe. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm at Art Knitter. So we can put up the first image and the images that I'm showing tonight um, uh, the ones that I've made during the pandemic are here, and then I'm showing images that relate to the processes that I use and the decisions that I make in um, making the pieces. So while I normally work with con uh, concepts related to nature, evolution, and ecology, this is a definite change from that as it strictly relates to social activism. And while my daily walks are usually geared at observations of the natural world, this piece, which I call Skin in the Game, was instead influenced by the human presence of much graffiti and signage in my neighborhood that sprung up after the killing of George Floyd. This piece for me also is a call to myself as a renewed commitment as a white woman to dig deep into current theories and understandings of racism and of whiteness and to give voice and action to fighting the injustices resulting from institutional racism. But when I made the work, I wanted to reflect the materials and textile language that I commonly use. So I chose to make this in a small quilt format. It's made from gut that's dyed with black walnut, used dryer sheets and is backed with commercial felt and then stitched with thread. I like using text sometimes in my artwork and, and this particular piece is the first time that I've used text that is just bold lettering um, straightforward. Uh, next image. I included this image because it also is an example of the use of my text and my use of gut, which I like uh, for the materiality of it, but I also like its reference historically to uh, the use as parchment. So to me, it goes really well with the idea of text. This particular piece I made uh, for a show at the Wiseman Museum that was about Darwin. The show was called Dear Darwin. And uh, this piece called Dear Charles is a, an imaginary letter to Charles Darwin where I used a uh, way of making text that I had used in a variety of other forms. Actually, I came up with the idea of using text like this when I was at the Women's Art Institute, but I knit a chain of wire and treat it like ink. And then as I shaped the letters on the, the parchment, I stitch them down. So next image. This is a, it has been, it's long been uh, part of my art practice to keep several forms of written and visual journals. And I've continued to do that during the pandemic. Although I will say 
not as prolifically as I had hoped. I thought, wow, I'm just like going to be journaling all the time. But like a lot of the artists I've talked to, I'm not necessarily on fire 24 seven to be making art, even though I really do appreciate the spacious void um, in the quarantine life that allows me to journal. And so I started this journal, uh, which I had long been thinking about. I had wanted to do a journal that was just stitching and somehow reflected my mood. So this, which I call mood journal, um, for it, I created a substrate of gut and used dryer sheets. And then I had stitched on it with vintage silk just using the irregularities of the substrate and um, whatever I was feeling to guide the stitches that I make. Next image. This piece bridges my interest in materiality of the gut um, and experience from my daily walk and climate change. On one of my walks, I noticed a birch tree that had been killed by Japanese beetles. And I found left in their wake all of these beautifully eaten leaves that to me looked like lace. So I collected them and uh, thought for a while about how I could turn it into some kind of a textile. And so I made this piece that I call Japanese beetle lace birch. And it is made from squares of used dryer sheets with gut, the decayed leaves, and it's inserted in a pocket of knit copper wire and then stitched through and stitched together. Hanging behind a piece which you can't really see from this photo are panels of silk uh, that are printed with my drawings of Japanese beetle. And one thing that I wanted to say about how this relates to climate change is there's one research study that indicated that there's a 300% increase in Japanese beetles because of the warmer climate in Northern states like ours. Next image. So this piece, which I call Sacred Solitude, is from a body of work where I used logs that were exposed because of flooding along Minnehaha Creek, the flooding being uh, influenced by climate change. And the motivation for these pieces was how elegant I thought that the, legs, the logs were decaying from water erosion and insect ac activity. So I highlighted the logs by embellishing these pieces of wood with knitting and stitching. Now, though it's quite hard to see, this particular piece is covered with very fine um, knit wire. Next image. This piece I included because it was a, one of my first experiments using large swaths of knitting which is something that I'm experimenting more with during this pandemic. Each piece is knit from a body-sized tube of wire, and then in it is a rusted piece of gut and uh, layered with additional pieces of knit wire. I, I titled it Entrapment and Transformation, and it was made in response to the book, The Last Chapters, which was written by Leslie Schwartz. She wrote this memoir of her incarceration in part at an artist residency where we met each other. She resonated with my work and asked if I'd be interested in creating work to go with her book, so I did. And then the final image is so that work predates this work, which in this uh, freedom of time, I wanted to work out working with um, swaths of, of knit wire and uh, going into bigger installations. This piece, which I call COVID-19 blue, is very specifically relating to my experience in the pandemic, which hasn't been, um, probably as negative as it has been for some people. Uh, one of the things that I noticed very early in the quarantine, which I loved, was the reduction in the amount of traffic when I would go on walks and the reduction of uh, plane flights. 
I live in the corridor of the plains and they were almost non-existent for a while there. And I, that made me curious about the positive effects of the quarantine caused by uh, the pandemic. And so I started looking into see if indeed the skies were healthier. They seemed bluer to me in Minnesota um, and they were indeed quite a bit bluer in other places. So one of the things that I, I uh, well, so it turns out that these changes in human behavior allowed what are called natural experiments, um, which take place around an event that happens and then researchers can uh, react to this natural event that happened. And I discovered that in Delhi, which is the most polluted city in the world, that for the first time in nearly 30 years, residents could see Mount Everest in the Himalayas, which are 125 miles away. And then I also learned as I enjoyed my increased quietude in my own neighborhood, that another consequence of the pandemic quarantine included reduced sound pollution. An amazing example of this that I learned is the impact on the vocalizations of certain humpback whales. So Alaskan cruise ships dominate the waters that are the home where some humpback whales live, causing massive sound pollution in the ocean. But because the cruise ships have been unable to sail, the whales have been able to communicate in ways that are new to researchers. Uh, a way that it was explained that ordinarily what the whales have to do would be akin to how humans have to shout across each other all the time in a noisy room where they can barely hear each other. When we have to do this, we know we certainly have to limit what we say and how we say it. So um, uh, making this piece was mostly about the blue skies, but I was interested in the other kinds of pollution that were happening from this pandemic. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to say about the uh, advantage of this time, I, I'm not as influenced about the amount of time that I have just because of the pandemic, because I did three years ago also retire from my day job, which was as a psychologist. So I've had um, a surplus of time in general to make art that's unlike any other time in my life. but. Because of the quarantine, there aren't exhibitions going on so much, and um, you know I don't have deadlines so much, which I tend to really respond to. And so this gave me more time than I usually have to play around with making bigger pieces and um, experimenting with how I might hang them. And it is true that after I got invited to be a part of this exhibition that I was scrambling to get the deadline to get it photographed so I could submit it. Um, but still, I actually got to hang this way more times than any other piece I've ever fooled around with. So I think that that is my time. Oh, yes. Thanks. Yes. And so I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Pat, I believe it's back to you. Okay. It's back to me. And I just, uh, so we are going to take a little bit of a, time here to recognize some of the other artists who are in the exhibition here tonight. And then we're going to get to a few questions. Um, so um, here's how we're going to do this. Um, oh, but of course, first I wanted to say thank you so much to Fazia, Natalie, and to Carolyn uh, for your obvious dedication to your work um and your and your practice uh so very very um wonderful and for generously sharing your uh your thoughts about it and, and again being being so personal and being so uh clear ah oh, that's that's terrific so thank you Anyway, moving on. So as you know, we invited 16 artists to share their work in this exhibition. And I believe 
not, about nine are here tonight had said that they were going to come. So I want to briefly introduce them now so you can get a sense of who's behind this exhibition. So artists in the exhibition, uh, except for of course, Fazia, Natalie and Carolyn, please unmute yourselves so you can say hello to the audience. I'm going to do this in alphabetical order. So you know that Beth Bergman is up first, Beth. Hi, everybody. Hello, Beth. Hi. Am uh, I, what am you? I supposed to say? It's where nice being here. Um, where am I? I'm in yeah. St. Paul, Minnesota. And what's your main uh, main medium? Um, painting with <laughs> other stuff thrown in. So. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you very much. Uh, Rita Collins. Yes. Hello. Oh, <clears throat> hello, Rita. Hello. Where are and you? Rita? I'm in Eureka, Montana. So the northwest corner of Montana. And currently I'm working with quilts. Yeah, and you have some lovely quilts, images of your quilts in the uh, exhibition. So. Thank you. Check that out. Thank you. Uh, Teresa Crabelli. Hi, um, I'm in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. And um, it was mentioned briefly about Native American culture. If you ever find yourself here, we're, we're down the road from Moundville. This valley had 10,000 people in a village. Uh, so I wanted to say something about that. I'm a collage artist, so I cut up old books and make collages out of them. And thank you also for inviting me. Um, uh, it's been really great being a part of this project. Great. Thank you for contributing. Mm -hmm. uh, Paola de la Caccia. She doesn't recognize her name because I've just mangled it. Paola? Oh, maybe she couldn't join us. Paula, you have to unmute yourself. And we'll see if she shows up. Uh, Nicole Drilling. Hello, I'm Nicole. Hi, Nicole. I'm Minneapolis, and my primary medium is watercolor. Thank you for letting me be part of this exhibition. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Uh, Sarah Kilgallen. I heard from Sarah earlier and she is in Portugal and so it's her bedtime. Um, <laughs> but Sarah's an amazing photographer and multimedia artist who is doing some really incredible work inspired by her time in Portugal right now. So you should definitely check out her work. Okay, thanks for letting us know that. I, I realize Portugal is a long ways away time-wise. <laughs> so. uh, how about Catherine Alice Michaelis? Mayday Press. Hi, um, it's, yeah, that's me. Hi, okay. um, Catherine Ellis Michaels. It, it's Michael. pronounced different than it looks. Hi. Um, I, Sorry. Michael with an S, Michaels. Um, I live south of Seattle by about uh, an hour and a half on um, unseated Suwamish peaks and land and uh, near the Nisqually Basin on the Salish Sea. And I'm a printmaker. I make artist books primarily. I work with plant themes and plants as dyes and mark, mark making with plants and um, kind of some numerous other things on the periphery. Okay, thank you. Um, Gwen sure. Hart. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Gwen and, um, oh, I'm in the dark here. Um, I am, um, I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I am a printmaker, but I work in drawing yeah, and book arts as well. Good. And I'm happy to be invited to be in the show. It's wonderful. We're happy to have you. Thank you. Uh, Nancy Robinson, did you get your audio fixed? Yes. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. <laughs> what, is it too loud? No, uh -huh. no, you're fine. Where are you? You can't see me? 
No, just tell everybody where you live. Oh, um, I live in, um, let me see. Oh, there I am. Okay, I live in downtown St. Paul, Minnesota. I live in my studio and I'm a painter. I paint oil on canvas mostly, but I also do acrylic on and other mediums, casein and egg tempera and all kinds of stuff. Oh, thanks, thanks. And I thought I saw Susan Hensel. Yeah. Susan, unmute yourself, Susan. Hi there, I'm Susan Hensel. I live in South Minneapolis and I'm working primarily in digital embroidery and being able to show at this time was absolutely wonderful because the day that we were shut down, so were all my shows. So everything I had scheduled was canceled. So it was very hopeful and lovely Good. to have suddenly have a show. Good. Yeah, yeah. Good. One of my shows was canceled twice and now maybe the third time is a charm, maybe. Good, cross our <laughs> fingers. Yeah. yeah, really. <laughs> is there anybody else who, uh, is, is uh, uh, in the invited portion of the show that uh, I'm not aware of. Unmute yourself now or forever hold your peace. Anybody? Okay, well I, huh? Well, I really appreciate everybody showing up and to also very generously showing your work. It's, it's, it's been a blast for me. And perhaps for Paige too, so she'll let you know. Um, okay, so um, if you haven't already, uh, I invite you to visit the Catherine G. Murphy Gallery website uh, to see this remarkable show. And if you want to know more about the all of the artists, we have an online catalog that you can download, and we have artist statements and short bios for everyone there. So you can find out more about um, all the artists in the show by going, going to the exhibition. Um, now we do have some time for a few questions um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Paige to uh, moderate that. Yes, thank you, Pat. And yes, of course, it's been, I was just saying to friends how nice it is to be able to connect to artists and artists appreciators in this time of the pandemic. Um, but if you wanna unmute yourself and if you have a question for an artist or the artist, uh, please feel free. Or if you like using the chat function, you can also ask a question that way. We, we do wanna respect your time. So we'll just be spending a few minutes, but um, we would love to hear from you. Okay, this is where I take out my, uh, I have some, some uh, questions also. So if, if you are being shy, uh, as you may have noticed, I am not shy. Um, I have a question for uh, all of the artists uh, and you can decide if you'd like to respond. Um, but Fazia, Natalie, and Carolyn, something that really sparked my interest um, about all of your work is the focus on process, meditation, and practice. If any of you would like to speak to that beyond what you've already said, I would love to hear uh, any of your aha moments and insights from the pandemic about process that maybe you didn't point uh, have time to talk about. I will say something. Um, I think the more I make art, the more I focus on process. And I think the work that I showed is not stuff that I normally do. I don't draw. I'm a sculptor primarily. I do installation work. And and I my work tends to be much more organic. So I don't, you know, do dig digital anything. <laughs> but um, I can be very intimidated by drawing. And so this allowed me to, to kind of feel what that process is like. And as I said, 
it's it's made me realize that through process comes discovery and new work and so the work that i'm doing now for the grant i'm focusing more on the process there and it's it's revealing new things to me in new directions that i can go on great thank you very much uh, I can say something. Um, I was just going to say that because there's so little actual uh, contact with people, I, I, you know, because I am process driven and because I am, I would say I'm intuitive and meditative about my artwork that that part isn't really different, but I realized how much I rely on interacting with other artists either kind of directly or or indirectly even and how much what they are doing or saying is something that I bounce off of in my own process and so that's that's something I've become more aware of since the pandemic great thank you Natalie any thoughts yeah um well I think with this project specifically, um, I have a tendency to get really caught in my head. And so I end up with all of these ideas and thoughts and notes, but then I struggle with how to translate them into an art project or into something um, where I actually know what I'm working on. And so with this, because I had the limitation of the form and I had the vocabulary of the brush strokes, um, it really helped in setting some boundaries and in kind of allowing those things to be what they were while I worked within those constraints. And I think that really helped as well, just with the sense that, um, you know, I've been getting since March that there's this parallel version of myself living a normal life or living a life where this didn't happen right alongside me. And that's something that I think about in my artwork too, that if I make a choice, I've somehow annihilated all of these other possibilities. Um, and so it was kind of a way to accept that, um, that this thing was going to happen and that it was defined and kind of brought into being by having those constraints of form and brushstroke vocabulary, um, while also kind of having faith in, um, the the horses that never happened I guess um, so I kind of I learned to have a little bit more faith in in the process and in kind of making choices and letting go of the things that were never meant to happen fabulous does anyone have a follow-up question if not I can um, pass it back to Pat and Nicole yeah, there's no questions coming up on the chat, although there are some very nice um, there's some some very nice comments. So if you're inclined to do check out the the chat. Function. Yes, love love all the mentions of inspiration. Yeah. So. Well, this concludes then our virtual artist talk for Pandemic Art Lessons, the online initiative of the Women's Art Institute. Uh, as I've been saying, do check out the show. I mean, I kind of presume you have, but do it again. It, it stands, the, stands a second, third, and fourth look, I think. Uh, and again, these are at the uh, Catherine G. Murphy Gallery uh, web pages. So gallery.stkate, S T K A T E dot E D U. Um, as Nicole mentioned, uh, this exhibition is going to fe be featured on the gallery website until December 11th. But after that, it is going to uh, continue to be archived there. And we're hoping to post a recording uh, of this event tonight for your review. There will be no test. So don't worry. Um, when you're on the gallery website, uh, check out the article about the show from the Highland Villager. They wrote a very nice uh, article. It's a St. Paul neighborhood newspaper and it focuses on the St. Paul artists in the show, but it's, it's quite nice to get that sort of press in your own backyard. 
And uh, do consider uh, submitting an artwork that you've made during the pandemic to our pandemic art annex. Uh, we're uploading new images every week. We would love to see what you've been up to. And it, you know, we'll, it does, I think it will provide something of a, um, of a, uh, a space, uh, a kind of touchstone of this time and place, uh, which is so crazy. Just, just, so um, I think, so be part of that. If you haven't already, please be part of that. Um, so thank you to Nicole, to Paige, to Fazia, to Natalia, not Natalie, see, I'm trying to say two people's names at the same time. Fazia, Natalie, Carolyn, and thank you all for joining us tonight. And don't forget to tell your friends or maybe even yourself about June's Summer Studio Intensive. Good night. Thank you for coming. <laughs>